completing this session on finance and economic empowerment. So I'll introduce our, our guest panelists and panelists. Uh, we have Sarah, so please join us in the Sarah Lorraine. <laughs> Introduce themselves. So we have a great, a great a variety of people here in the field of business, economic um, literacy. So they're going to tell you a bit about themselves. So our guests want to start to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about what you do. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thanks, Desiree. Uh, can you guys hear me? All right. Yeah. Because I was worried there's no microphone. Like, can they hear us? Yeah. Uh, okay, so my name is Watsi and I'm originally from Zimbabwe. I've been here for 16 years this year um, and I've been working in the financial services, financial planning um, industry for the past 11 years and in end of 2015 I started a social enterprise called Economics. So focuses on uh, women and financial empowerment. So uh, my enterprise has got a group of about, at the moment we've got 500 women on a Facebook group called Economic Sisterhood, where women come to talk about money, let's talk about budgeting, savings, investing. Um, I bring resources to them, um, and they share whatever works for them financially. Um, and I also do events every few months, on, which, which are called Economics Money Conversation. So the last one was on pay rise negotiations. Uh, the next one in August will be on superannuation and the importance of uh, building your superannuation that you have enough money in retirement. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's me in a nutshell. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm um, Maya Say. So I'm not really going to talk about finance, um, but a little bit about IT, software development. Um, so I'm a business analyst, I work for a software engineering company. and. My background is I'm Zambian, um, and one of the important things I guess when I think about the work that I do is in IT, everybody knows it's a male-dominated um, industry, so how do I, as a female to begin with, and an African female, get noticed, do the right work, and be a leader? So right now, I manage a team of about 15 people, and of those 15 people, 10 of them are men. So the programmers in my team are men. How do I manage and lead that relationship? Um, so if you have questions around that, I can talk a little bit more about that. And I also have a blog, Quetsu.com, and it's very exciting to have Kandu in here because <laughs> she was one of the first people that I interviewed um, three years ago now when I started the blog. And the blog is about sharing different stories of what people of African heritage are doing. So whether it's writing, whether it's business, and that has also connected me with people in Australia doing different things from African heritage, but also on a broader perspective, people in the diaspora, which is, I guess, this summit kind of brings that together. So for me, everything is about bringing people together, sharing different stories, and also as a female leader who's of African heritage, how do you only just, not only make yourself visible, but be successful in the industry that is now dominated. So if you have questions around that. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Lorraine Buena and I am also from Zimbabwe. I am someone who runs my own business, it's called Useful Link. And what I do is I run workshops for young people at schools, universities, and youth organizations. Um, I run workshops around employment, leadership, and personal development. And a lot of my story is actually connected to why I do that. Um, having finished my degree in 2013, I couldn't get a job, and I've done a degree in public health at the Trophy. So there's been a bit of a journey to finally get me to the point where I started to do something about an issue that I thought was important to me. Um, other than that, I also speak to government and businesses around empowering young people and advocating for young people. And probably just like Mayase, I'm sure you would imagine speaking to government. I am this black 27-year-old girl in front of all these males who are probably 50 plus. So it's always a very interesting situation when I walk into the room and they 
hear that, you know, I'm the one coming to speak, and they kind of look at me like, uh, this child. So, <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's the other work that I do. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Cole. Uh, I'm Nigerian, but I was born in Canada, was in New Zealand for a little bit, and then grew up here, um, specifically in Wagga Wagga, New South Wales. I don't know if anyone's been, but it's a small rural town. Uh, my family was one of the first black people there, <laughs> so that was, that was a scene. <laughs> um, uh, but at the moment, um, I run my own company called Amp Time, so we match um, families with people who can help them out with household needs. I'm also on the board of the Foundation Young Australians, which I got involved with just because I was really passionate about helping people in regional areas, I guess, find their agency and realise how many opportunities are available for you. Um, and I'm also on the um, Diversity Council of Oak Tree, and um, just and recently just started working with the G20 Entrepreneurs Alliance, so the Australian Sherpa. And so part of that, like this year, we were really proud because we actually had a, we were one of the only countries of the probably 30 or 40 countries that are involved that actually had 55% women, and it's all men. I'm the only female, um, one of two females in the leadership position um, going through there as well. So very similar to you, just kind of going into all these spaces when people don't have kind of expect you to have any human value to say. And I think one of the most common things that's been said to me, especially since I moved here last year for a water again, was just having someone like you get here. Um, and it's always just like, oh, well, I took the train. So. <laughs> 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 surprise, surprise, it's not usually the answer they want. Right. Um, but yeah, so it was really cool to kind of share any experiences if anyone else is also from small towns or anything like that as well. Thank you very much. And to start things off, I guess we, one of the major things that affects us is taking the first step and it's really lovely to hear from their experiences about how you had an idea in your head. You talked a bit about what you do, but how did you start from an idea to really doing what you are doing? What has the journey been like for you, like the specifics and the challenges that you have come across? And the support that you have got to go have not so much. Okay, great question. Okay, so the funny thing is that my journey, like to be where I am today, it literally took the 11 years after university where I kind of jumped from job to job because I did a, a Bachelor of Commerce. So I went to UGD here and did a Bachelor of Commerce. Then after I did a Master of Accounting and I didn't like accounting. So I didn't go into being a company. I just started doing superannuation, banking. And I remember even when I was a little girl, I, I knew I wanted to do something with women, but it wasn't clear what that was. So there was always this kind of very broad goal, but it wasn't very specific. And over the years, when I was working in finance, I remember thinking, I'm wasting my time. I should be doing something to do with women. I wasted 10 years. When I was 10 years in finance, I'm like, I. I started crying. I, I remember calling my sister saying, I wasted my life. You know, I was being very dramatic. And my sister was like, what do you mean you've wasted your life? I'm like, I've been 10 years in finance. What am I doing? And, you know, and then my, my sister was like, hello, you're in finance. You're passionate about women's economic empowerment. Hello, <laughs> connected. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, of course. Um, and it took a while and I'm like, okay, I want to do something in women and, and money and finance. And the funny thing is that whatever you do, even if you don't think it's related, it's going to be a great platform for whatever you decide to do. You learn with every single situation, every single role you do, even if it doesn't seem connected, it's connected in some way. So um, so I think in 2015, that's when it became clear that I wanted to do some sort of community, like bringing women together to talk, because women love to talk, to come together, to talk and, uh, and I remember asking, and I just started just asking women, what do you want around money? Because a lot of Australian financial services companies very male-centric. I work in financial planning, and 80% of the financial planners in Australia are white men. And so a lot of women feel, you know, left out. So I decided I wanted to open up a space where they didn't feel condescended to or looked down on. And I started this group, and that's kind of, it, it's been one of those things where it's become clearer with just taking action and also getting feedback from the ladies as to what they want. So it's, it's something that just gets clearer with time. You, you don't always start knowing exactly where you're going, but with time it becomes clearer. And you'd be happy to know that, maybe because I'm you know, Zimbabwean and an African lady, but majority <coughs> of the women who 
hour on the Economic Sisterhood page, 70% are black ladies, they're African women. And I, that's, that really gets me excited. I feel very happy that I've been able to open up that space for them. So the idea starts very vague, but with taking action, trial and error, it becomes clearer what you want to do and where you want to go. Okay, so you just start with your network and talk yeah. to people and invite and just ask people what do you want as well. Like the people you're trying to help, ask them what they want and get that feedback and use that to start something. So similar to Sarah's advice, so starting something like an enterprise or a business, from that idea stage to mobilizing the people, how do you then go on to starting up a business? You must have to register and do a few things you put on the How do you go about that? Okay. Sarah, so I guess in, in my case, I guess the, the trigger point for me was I went to a hackathon and then it was just, I really got excited about the idea of working on it because I really thought that parents needed a lot more support. Um, but then to be even more honest, it was really, I just thought, well, why not? <laughs> why not, why not give it a go? I was supposed to start law school rather than um, move to Melbourne. Um, but when I decided I wanted to pursue that idea, I did my master entrepreneurship at the University of Melbourne. Um, because I was, I didn't have any background in business. I did my undergrad in PR and advertising. And that was after I had a year of film studies. Um, so it was really kind of going in blind. But even then, like before I even started the masters, during the, the summer break, if before I started, my co-founder and I just decided to put up some ads on Instagram to see what would happen. And that was our first sales, just going through that. So it really is just kind of taking that first step and seeing what happens. And I think especially for entrepreneurship. Um, if you're just testing an idea, depending on what it is, you don't even necessarily need to go through the whole process of registering a business or anything like that. We actually didn't um, take the steps to do that until we had enough demand and we're like, all right, this is actually something people are going to buy. It's something that it's actually really worth putting in the effort for. And even then, a lot of the advice we got was like, oh no, just start doing it and see what happens. And then if you really commit, then do it. But for us, it really just came down to the fact that because we were going into people's homes and we were looking after their children, we actually just needed the insurances. Otherwise, we probably would have waited even longer. Because for us, it was probably after a couple of months of testing the idea we actually incorporated. Um, but um, we were also quite lucky that my undergraduate university um, does free legal help. So we just called them up and they actually took us through the whole process of registering a business online. But I find for people who don't have that sort of type of support, there's so many great websites and groups on Facebook as well where if you kind of post and say, I just need help and taking that first step, people will go out of their way and just sit down and have coffee with you and explain their whole process. And that's probably been one of the saving graces for me. If there's anything I don't know about, I would just go to one of those groups and post to ask me for some of my mentors in my life from when I did my master's degree and then just find out all the answers because no matter what, somebody else has done it. So there are answers. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely am. Um, I love what you said about mentors. I think that was it for me. Um, mentors are everything. Um, I was talking to a group recently and I was just telling them that, you know, in Zimbabwe we have this cultural thing where like before you get married, all your aunties sit you down and they talk to you about marriage and what to expect of it. And they do the same when you have a child, right? So why don't we have those kind of systems for before I start a business? Why don't I sit around with people who are already doing business? Yeah and hear from them and hear their struggles yeah. and that kind of thing. So for me, it was definitely people who mentored me along the way. And I think as well as not just, you know, focusing on just, you know, African people who mentored me, but other people who mentored me, you know, different CEOs, ministers that I met along the way who know something that I don't, right? And that, that, was, very, um, that was very important for me. I wouldn't be able to run my business without my mentors yeah. and then like guiding me through some of those things. So. So for, from your experience, for someone who is like a student or someone who is isolated and who doesn't necessarily have the social networks to say, oh, this is a mentor in my field, how, how would you encourage people to step up and have that confidence? What sort of conversation can people have with potential mentors to say, oh, I would like you to mentor me on this is the sort of growth I go through? I don't have to that one quickly. Just because when I, when I started, I was in Wobba and I was, I was in Wobba because I was quite sick. Um, but I was very, very bored. So I just started emailing people. Um, I actually, like, sneakily, I found this woman on LinkedIn and I just found her Facebook because I knew that she definitely replied. And I just sent her a message explaining that I was like, 
creating this platform and I was just kind of starting out and I wanted to know what she had to do. And she was just so surprised I asked her that I ended up now we're like really good friends and she's someone that I was really really into of just kind of reaching out. Um, and then I still do the same on LinkedIn. Like I'll add people on LinkedIn and then write a message saying why I'm adding them, what questions I have to ask, and then a bit about my background and just leave it to them to reply. I find often it takes like a couple of months just because people are quite busy, but they always will reply and that always really surprises me. So I think if you're quite quite isolated in that way, there's always a way to yeah, to just find people that way. Thank you. Um, my last thing I want to ask. So did you transition straight from being a student to working or what has your journey been like? Um, yeah, I did. So in my final year of studying, I did an internship. So for the last semester I was working for an IT company. Um, and I think those things are important to think about when you're studying. Don't just wait until you finish your degree and then you're gonna get into the job is that everybody knows it's really hard to look for work. And if you start building that relationship when at uni, the you know, uh, associations, I was part of the uh, computer association, that's how they got me connected to the internship and in my final year, I was working for that company, interning after uni, that company hired me, so I worked with them for a while. So it's important to think about when you're studying, what are the things that you need to do, what are the things that you need to kind of connect yourself with, make sure you're in the right groups, talk to people in those groups, because all those connections kind of then add up. And sometimes it's just randomly, you're at an event, maybe a meetup, or you're talking to somebody and they're like, oh, actually, I know somebody who's in this industry that is interested, maybe does the same things as you do. It's important to also show your work. I think touching on mentoring as well. Mentoring is a give and take as well. You're not just gonna go to somebody and say, hey, mentor me, like, let me absorb all these things from you. You need to give something back to your mentor as well, because they're giving you something, you're giving them something back. So it's important to kind of visualize those things. And when you're um, in working, in the work industry, what I've found is, don't be afraid to take a challenge, right? The first time I was told to be an iteration manager for a team of 10 people, I freaked out. I was like, I can't do it. How, how do you expect me to do this job? They're like, and I'm like, just transitioning. I'm like, I need more time. And my manager at the time was really good and would have told me, I know you can do this. You, know, you need to have those type of people who are supporting you there. I know you can do this. And when you fall, you're going, I'm going to be there. And so when I couldn't do it, I actually went back and I'm like, can you help me with this? And they're like, all right, have you thought about this? Try this with your team, do that. Having those support systems, I swear it's a godsend because you will find challenges everywhere, whether it's at work, it's at home. Having the right people to talk to and sometimes just bouncing ideas. Oh, I'm going through this, what do you think? Maybe they'll tell you nothing, but maybe they'll tell you something that you can use. And making sure you don't bottle it up because there's lots of things and challenges that you go through, whether it's in the workplace, at school, at home. If you don't have the right people around you to talk to or to support you, <coughs> it really just hinders that progress. Yes. And speaking along the lines of challenges, what challenges have you encountered personally and also with the people you interact with in your life of work? What challenges have you identified specifically for African? Well, you know, like, as an African woman working in the corporate Australian sphere, um, in finance, I think over the past 11 years, I've pretty much been, in most of the jobs I've been to, I've been the only black person there. Always, like, probably I should count, like, maybe one or two places where, where I saw another black person, and I'm just, like, all excited because, I'm like, oh, hello. But I'm usually the, the token minority not those jobs that I've been to. So because of that, what what happens is that they, they even when people are not it's not necessarily being they're not bad people, but they've got stereotypes in their heads about me and who I am and about what I can actually achieve. So one thing you need to know is that as an African woman or man or you know um you you go into an environment and some people already have a belief in what you can achieve. You need to understand that if somebody tells you, you know, somebody who's got their own narrow view of what you can do tells you, oh, you can't do that, don't take that to heart. Don't necessarily believe that. You need to say, okay, this is what I want you to do. I will give it a go, I'll try. Um, in terms of challenges, like 
I was telling you before when I was thinking of my idea, it was very difficult for me to know what exactly I wanted to do. And because when it comes to economic empowerment, there's so many different um, assets. It's like, what do you focus on? And because if you make it too broad, it's not really going to get anywhere. So kind of the challenge of actually trying to be very clear about what I'm trying to do. Um, and I think the challenge as well of really, of networking, okay, for me it's not a challenge because I'm a very social person, but there's still that challenge of getting the right type of mentors, as the ladies were talking about. I would not be here if it wasn't for mentors. And mentors, my mentors are very diverse. Maybe <coughs> I've got mentors from African background, I've got male and female mentors, I've got Australian, um, you know, mentors, I've got mentors from different um, aspects of different parts of life. So if you get a variety of mixture, the challenge is that what you're talking about, somebody, one of those people knows what to do. So if you just make sure you ask people, a lot of people want to help. Like a lot of people are ask, you know, like Sarah was saying, a lot of people are worried about asking people, but a lot of these mentors, they get something back from mentoring people. So when you actually uh, ask them, you'd be surprised how many of them are waiting for you to come and ask. So just do that and any challenge, you find somebody you can what else? Um, I think my biggest challenge has just been believing in myself that I'm actually skilled, I'm actually talented, and that is okay. Because sometimes you look at managers somewhere, or you look at someone, you're like, that person is great, they're a great speaker, or that person is great, they're a great leader. I want to be that person. And then you try so hard to be that person without kind of focusing what are the things that you can pick from people. You pick things from but in your core, you need to be sure about who you are, what type of a leader you are, what you're bringing to them, and you grow that, and you add, you know, they're just spices, you know, you add something from Lorraine, you add something from Wati, but that's not you, you just pick on things and make sure your core is strong, that you're not trying to be somebody else. You can look at somebody else, try and think about what they're good at and how you can emulate that, but that person is not you. Be strong in who you are, Make sure you know your core strengths, your talent, your skills, and then use that as you go ahead. Yeah. So just a quick question about that. Because sometimes what most, uh, from experience, what we tend to do is we look at a job description and we say, oh, these are the skill sets. And then we, we cross the lines and just, you know, we disqualify ourselves. So how do you navigate that? How do you overcome <laughs> that? That's a very good one. Okay, this is something that you guys want to know. Women, right, when they look at a job description, if there's like 10 skill sets, they want to check all 10 of them. If they don't check all 10 of them, they don't actually usually apply. But a man can look at the same job and check five and go be like, I can do this. An example is my, my sister and her fiance. <coughs> you know, she is fantastic, she's experienced. And she was looking at this job, she had checked about eight out of 10, and she was like, oh, I can't do that. And her fiance is like, he, he checked two out of ten of a job and he's like, I'm so good at this, I can do this. <laughs> There's this innate um, confidence um, within uh, boys and men. And I think that's a lot to do with socialization of girls and boys growing up. And I think it's a lot to do with, I think a lot of women or girls growing up were not allowed to kind of, you know, make mistakes and just go out there and do things, fail get up and do it again and boys are kind of like you know you can go out there and just play and they, they're okay with that so they're willing to give it a try even if they're gonna fail they still try so i think it's that mindset of and i understand it's very difficult to bring up your confidence but for me personally confidence is it's not waiting for perfection it's just taking action because taking action people wait for some sort of inspiration to take action or confidence but confidence actually comes from, from taking action so you just take small <coughs> actions and it builds up to bigger and bigger things. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely resonate with that because even with, like when I started my business, this was actually before I realized that I wanted to do business. So um, I mentioned before that there's a bit of a story as to how I started what I'm doing. So you know, I finished public health 2013, couldn't get a job for eight months. And you know, I was frustrated. I, I felt like I was potentially losing it, to be honest, sitting at home and just applying every day. It just gets exhausted. So um, I went to South Korea for five months just because I needed a break. So I went to South Korea for five months and I went and I taught English <coughs> just because it was something to do. You know what I mean? Somebody was paying me and I was doing something. And 
while I was in South Korea, I decided I'd come back home and do my master's in community development, which is the area of public health I was interested in. So I come back, and as soon as I started my master's, I knew that I needed to get experience, and, you know, rub shoulders with the right people, you know, internships and all of that. So I started, um, I was on the uh, youth advisory board for Center for Multicultural Youth, and I'm also a board of directors for another organization. So in those places, right, that's where I like, met a lot of people, met a lot of people who mentored me and all of that. And every time I'd meet other young people who had finished uni and they didn't get a job, it was frustrating. I was like, if employment has changed, why are we not being told? Why isn't someone going into schools and telling your 11, year 12 students that, hey, you need to start trying to find this experience now. And this is what employers are actually after. And why are people going to universities and doing the same? So I worked with a few different um, organizations who worked in that kind of space. And eventually I decided, you know what, I'm going to do something about it. So in that whole like confidence, fear, how do you start? I literally picked up the phone. I remember it was a Tuesday morning. I picked up the phone. I called my city council and the youth person, this is Mountain City Council, and the youth person was like, oh, hi, you know, my name is so-and-so. And I was like, hi, my name is Lorraine, and I want to speak to your students. I, I want to speak to young people in this uh, city of, of, of Mountain. And she was like, to me, um, sorry? And like, I explained myself, you know, I told her a bit of my story and whatever. And she was like, to me, you know, we don't get calls like this. And she's like, because of that, I want to meet you now. Right? It wasn't because like, I felt like I had everything together or anything like that. But my frustration drove me to want to do something about it. And I've been learning as I've been going. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm still learning and so much other stuff. But that particular day, I decided to just do something. And you don't have to wait until you have it all figured out. Some of the people that like I asked to come and do work for me, this girl who does like my videos, my promo stuff, she's this girl who's literally like, she's what, 21? She's a YouTuber who's kind of starting out. I watched her YouTube videos. I'm like, I like her style. She doesn't have a degree in media and communications. I like what she does. I like her style. So she was like to me, oh, I'm happy to do your promo. I'm like, great. So people are becoming more flexible. So think about what are my skills, right? And how can I get in and just step out and do it? Do you know about South Korea? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like what, 
do they eat? <laughs> and I'm just like, okay, I live in Melbourne, the, one of the most multicultural cities in the world. Okay, whatever I need to know about South Korea, I'm sure I'll find out. You know what I mean? Another question was like, what does teaching English have to do with public? <laughs> and it was just like, they, I think they just didn't understand where I was. You know what I mean? There's nothing like sitting at home for eight months and applying for jobs every day. And you know, I'm, I'm such a doer, you know, I'm, I'm always on the go doing something and not being able to do just really was affecting me. So, and I must say, like, I'm, I'm a very big, like, you know, parent pleaser, you know, I'm first born, you know, and please your parents, but I just, I just had to do it. I, I don't know, I can't explain how, but I just had to do it. And I think what I'll definitely tell young people about, you know, working with parents and all of that, parents want to see results. They don't care about how you feel, like, you know, like, how you feel, no, 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 they care about how you feel, they don't care about how you feel about what you want to do. Right? Yes. It's not like, oh, mom and dad, like, you know, I'm feeling like I want to start a business. They just want to know that, you know, will this business be able to take care of you? Right? Yeah. Will your job, will you be able to get a job? They want to see results. So when I realized that, I stopped feeling like I had to keep defending my ideas. I'm just like, when they see results, they'll calm down. Yeah. Until That's then, true. I just need to keep moving. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So when I got to South Korea, and I'm like, you know, I sent a video of where I was staying, and, you know, took photos of my students and whatever. When I left, my dad was like, you have to call me every day. Two weeks in, he wasn't even picking up his phone. Like, <laughs> you know, so, results, you know what I mean? She's like, she's okay, she's safe. South Korea is one of the safest countries in the world. She's safe, she's got food. Do you know what I mean? So like, think about, I want to produce results, <laughs> and that will bring people to like to calm down. Other than that, you'll be explaining yourself for a very long time. Yeah, sure. yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, I can add a few um, interesting nuggets because I have always so I, I'm, I'm, I've got three other siblings. So uh, two of us are here in Australia, and most of my family are back in Zimbabwe. So even I was already a rebel by deciding to come to Australia for university because my grandmother is like, wait, where are you standing here? She was crying at the airport. What are you doing? Oh my God, I'll be dead. Oh, this, she's still alive. <laughs> 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 About 16 years later. So every time I go, I'm like, grandma, you're still alive. What are you doing? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I think the important thing when it comes to family, as you were mentioning, I think, they, they want results, yes, but I think one of the things as well, what they see, if they see yourself belief in yourself, if they actually can see that you believe in what you want to do, they might not necessarily understand it. And I'm not going to lie, my parents do not understand me one bit. In most things, they're very different. And we're so different that a lot of people are like, how, how is your mom and dad, you know, you're so out there, you know, I'm going traveling by myself, all these places. And, you know, at first it, it really scared them. Like, well, what do you mean you're going by yourself to Vietnam? Wait, what are you doing? But that's just my nature. But I think if you show that you've got that belief in yourself, I mean, it, it's, it's something that you need to work on. I mean, it's, it's not something that just comes overnight. And as Sarah was saying, you always, always will continue questioning yourself with time. And trust me, I know you're young now, but even as you get older, there's always going to be some, some doubt. But as long as you work on building that self-belief in yourself and you showcase that to your family and they, they see those results, as you're saying, they'll, they'll, they'll be on board and they'll, they'll mostly support you. It's very rare that they won't. So just keep on being focused on what you want to achieve and have that strong sense of self and acceptance of who you are and what you want to do. Um, I guess my only thing to add on is also not to be afraid to fail, right? because failure is going to come, but you have to learn from it. So even when you're thinking about you put your passion into it, you're very you know focused. You have your timeline, you have your management going. Things are going to fall yes. all over the place, yeah. and if that happens. It's not, you know, the end of the world. The most important thing is not to be afraid to fail. And when you fail, you learn something from it. Maybe you pivot, you start a, a 
another way, you think about it another way, you yeah. talk to other people, maybe you're talking to the wrong type of people or you just need something else. Yeah. But that's an important thing because if you think about life as just being a straight road yeah. and you're always just going to have success, yeah. then you're setting yourself up to fall. Yeah. So it's important to just have your support system and when you fail, that's okay. You can okay. start again. It's not you know, the end of the world. I guess for me, um, my my mom is probably my biggest supporter. Whenever I feel like I'm, I'll sometimes be like, oh no, this is too much. It's getting too hard. And my mom will be like, oh, but at least you have to just see it through for a while. Like if you make the choice, at least see what happens, and then you you don't have to have that. Oh gosh, what if I hadn't have given up? And I found like I was actually quite surprised um, that my mom has been so supportive of what is really uh, a very unorthodox career path of just like I'm supposed to start, so start a business at 22. <laughs> like, let's see what happens. But because I guess part of it as well for me has just been the fact that like if you're giving giving it your all and then as you said showing those results and then being able to show like the thing with my mom I don't when I speak to her I always say well the worst case is that I will go and get a job. Is that really that bad? <laughs> um, and yeah, yeah. And so and so I think I think you have that advantage when you're when you're young as well though. Just because, like, if you spend a year or two building something, it's not like you can't put that on the CV or anything. It's not like you haven't spent your time doing anything. Yeah, it's actually like you could say I've led a company, and that's something that most people won't be able to have. So I found when I put it that way to my mom, and then it was very clear results that she was like, "Oh, okay, I get it." And ever since, she's just been my biggest champion. And I really want to like just reiterate that point about like failure. Like last the last couple of weeks were probably two of the hardest weeks I've had since I started because my co-founder was overseas. And it just so happened to also coincide with just just that week things just we ended up just having so many inquiries and stuff so it was just really overwhelming but the thing that kind of got me through it was just remembering like this is just such like a problem for today and then tomorrow i'm going to completely forget about it i couldn't tell you when i was so stressed about last week just remember to be stressed <laughs> but it's already it's already over and like there's always going to be something else yeah. so yeah. you kind of like whenever i'm having that situation like this is only going to last in a couple of hours and then yeah, there's going to be something else it just really helps you put things in perspective yeah. it's just Thank you for making all these points, and it's very important for Africans, especially African women, to have that self resilience because sometimes our support networks fail. The people who we expect to be always there to support us and to encourage us, sometimes they also human and we fail. And you know, sometimes things don't go well. And growing up in a culture that is very results oriented, you always have to be doing things perfectly. That is not necessarily used to failure being a good thing. It's all about be, building the inner being and say, look, I'm going to you know, take this time to build myself up. Because yeah. that self-talk is very important. And I'm learning that myself. Because similar to Lauren, I came from a public health background and I thought everything was going to go you know, in a straight path. And I tell you this, how many years later, three years later, and I'm still figuring things out. So sometimes it's also good to just say to yourself, look, I don't have everything figured out. I don't have everything figured out. You know, I don't know even what I want. And it's okay to think that way. So sometimes talk to yourself. Be honest with yourself. So thank you very much, shall we? I'm going to the rest of the audience to ask our panelists questions. You um, awesome ladies. <laughs> you know, um, I am a research dietitian in entrepreneurship, and seeing your young people who research has confirmed that uh, there is a lot of innovation power that is embedded in the young people, and which can which can later result in you know, successful startups. So I have a number of what a social you but when you talked about social enterprise and your social enterprise in finance, I was wondering how would you how do you define you know social enterprise in your business? What is it that you are doing that you know results in you defining your business as or classifying it as a social enterprise? Okay. Good question because that's a that's a good question because I think there's a bit of controversy about what social enterprise actually is and even all worldwide you know different com 
countries, sometimes I've got different definitions of what latching is. Um, how I define it, I, I think, is when the driving goal of, of my company is social impact. Um, profitability is a way to sustain that social impact. So my passion is, so I, I'm also really big on seeing the research on women and money worldwide in Australia. And one of the biggest things that they found in research is women don't openly talk about money. The problem is not openly talking about something. It's, it remains in the closet, right? All the issues, the learnings that you can have when you openly talk about something, it doesn't happen. So in talking to women, and by the way, I know last year I talked to a lot of women of diverse backgrounds. That's when I realized women, you know, very similar in so many ways. I talked to Australian ladies, I talked to African Australians, I talked to so many different range, Asian, you know, ladies. And most of them were like, we would love to talk about money openly with other women. We would find it very comfortable to have a space where we can do that. Um, and doing that helps them take action. So with my, my group and with the events that I do, my focus is in bringing this space where women can openly talk about money, learn from each other, because one thing that I've learned is that a lot of women don't even understand one thing that they think is nothing is a big thing for another woman. So you've got women who are sharing all these things that they're doing, whether it's invest, investments, you know, investing in shares, and other women don't know how to start, so other women are helping them do that. So it's kind of helping women take action. And you've got the whole situation of the super gap. I work in finance and I see the gap between men and women when it comes to the, the time and money. And I think a few years ago, the big statistics that really shocked me was when the biggest demographic of homeless people is now um, 50, uh, 55 and above women. So uh, women who are 55 and above, uh, their homelessness rate is, is growing up. And that's because of a, a number of things to do with them, you know, taking more time out of the workforce to take care of children, whether to take care of their elderly parents or whatever. So my impact and why I call myself a social enterprise is because my focus is in, is in helping lower those statistics, helping women that make sure they've got money in time and making sure that women can get out of domestic violence situations because the Royal Commission on Family Violence showcased economic empowerment is a big thing that keeps some women in family violence situations. So talking about this type of thing with my organization is meant to bring that cultural shift in women to talk about money, to take action for themselves, to empower themselves, to educate themselves, and to, to build their wealth so that they actually are independent and can have choices in life. So that's why I call myself a social enterprise, but also 50% uh, of my profits goes to economic empowerment project as well. So, So even, you know, just a simple example, I had to write a lot of essays 
I've had to write a lot of essays, I've done research for my masters. Writing is a very big part, you know, of my studies. But also for me to be able to clearly articulate myself when I'm speaking to people, or writing to organizations, or writing to government, my education has actually been a very big part of allowing me to be able to do that. So yes, I mean I'm in support of the fact that I decided to go ahead and, you know, do my studies and then kind of make it to where I am now. I know that a lot of people will say things like, oh, you know, is it Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates? Yeah. You know, they're dropouts. Yeah, but they're dropouts from Harvard. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, they're very brilliant minds. You don't just walk into Harvard. Do you know what I mean? So it's a, I just find that Harvard really good. Completely agree with you in terms of education, but I feel that in this case I'm a rare case. Um, I came to Australia as a mother who had four children, was pregnant with her fifth child, and as a refugee. So I didn't have much of an educational background. But I think with education and with discipline, if education is your discipline. And I think when you go and integrate and you talk to people, and what you were talking about was mentors and you connect with mentors who have an education and what they give you is sort of an, it's an education yeah. and it's a narrative and I think for me I said I call myself a visionary storyteller and what does that mean? It means that you have passion and that passion fuels the purpose of your life and once you get that and I think that's where most cases we don't have the clarity but once we tap into that clarity of having a passion it puts you into, into the purpose field and that's where the field in which we service each other and it's all about service. So you could be a cleaner and be an entrepreneur yes. who do amazing and incredible things. <coughs> so although education does have its place, but it should not hold people back. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. we can all write. So then I agree with that we could clearly be um educated in spite of the education that we have yes. But then I just want you to know how that all happens because as you say it's very beautiful. It's just really good to do it. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely not. I think one more thing with business. So I run a business, but I don't have a business degree. Right? Yes. But even in that, when I stepped into the business world, there was a lot that I didn't know. And my mentors could only do so much for me. They can't feed me everything. So then I decided to go and do like, a, this organization was doing like a four month thing where you get to meet with mentors and get to look, learn the basics of business. So not in a university setting. So I learned about how to do my taxes as a business. I learned how, you know, the leadership, the legal stuff and whatever in a space of four months. Whereas someone else goes to, to a business degree for three years or something like that. So I understand definitely what you mean, but I feel like edu education is it's, it's not just degrees. You're always gonna have to know, know your art because there's a billion other people trying to do something. Yeah. What makes you stand out? Know your art. So educate yourself in whatever way you need to. That's very important. And to bring all together, education has to be Conscious. You know what you are passionate about. Yeah. Okay. You don't necessarily have to go to. To be honest with you, sometimes I get bogged down with writing essays and think and think, oh my god, when is this going to end? But you know what you are passionate about. Even your interaction with people is an education. Yes. I've learned a lot through Facebook, just Messenger. So when talking to people, you learn about so many things. You just have to be conscious. Ask yourself, what do you want to learn? That itself is an education. You have conventional education going to uni or TAFE, whatever, but also your interaction with people is also an education. So be conscious also about that. She has a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, no, I just had a question from the women who started their own businesses. So in the beginning of like the start of your business. Did you run into any issues with like financing all of your ideas and like how did you come across building your team? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I can, um, for me personally, when I started my organization, 
the reason why I guess I've been able to finance things, I self-financed, and that's because I decided to stay doing full-time work whilst I run the business. And it's tough, obviously, because I work Monday to Friday, which leaves very little time for me to run my business. But I decided to do that because as I was doing the testing of ideas and everything like that, I wanted to kind of get that sorted, to get that clarity first before I go out and try to look for funding externally. So because I work full time, that's another thing. A lot of people say, seem to think that you kind of need to throw everything out mm -hmm. with the back horse just because I'm starting a business doesn't mean I have to stop working. Because continuing to work has really been good. It's been hard, but it's been good in that it's given me that kind of, I can relax because I've got my personal finance and all these things taken care of. And it gives me extra money to finance my business as it starts. So if you're able to have a job whilst you're starting out, especially in the beginning, give yourself that um, le less of a headache because that way, even if you can't get financing externally from investors, you can finance the beginning by yourself. And then as, as it gets bigger and you've got something to show, it will be easier for you to go out and say, okay, look, at this is what I've done. Can I have some financing? Um, and in terms of building teams, a lot of it is, I haven't really had to try that much. I've got an intern at the moment. It's more to do with, I put myself out there. And I, I'm very big on social media, as uh, Desiree knows. And when you're out on social media, you seem to attract people who want to also do what you're doing. I mean, personally, I haven't yet gone to that point where I'm like, I need to get a team and like, you know, uh, hire somebody. Because so far, the two people that are in my team have all kind of just been attracted to me because I've been putting it out there that this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm passionate about. And anyone who wants to be involved, they're very welcome. And you, you'd be happy to know that the both of them are African ladies. So they all just kind of got there and I actually didn't look for them myself. But in the future, obviously, I plan to actually do the hiring and getting people down. But in terms of financing, I've just been self-financing because I do have a full-time job. But I know, you know, I think these guys can probably take the whole So they can get to that. Um, I guess, I guess on my end, the other reason why I could afford to start a business, um, and to be honest, to be 100% honest, why I did my master's degree is because I got a full scholarship. Um, and so part of it was like being able to study and work on a business at the same time was what the only reason why I was able to do this. Um, and then from that year of studying, and like I really just kind of kept it as, I kind of see, the whole reason why I still would, I, if I had to go back, I'd always go back to university. And like, I, I really love studying. I did honors degree as well. And I did my master's and I was going to do law for another three years. Just because I love that you meet so many people. And all the people that I work with and all the connections and opportunities I've had have really just come out through university connections. Um, and so that's why we've been able to finance ourselves um, on an ongoing basis. Um, for us, our business model is lucky, whereas we don't have to spend anything unless somebody buys it because it's service based. Which is good, which is gonna work until probably the end of the year. Because when you want to expand, then you would want more funding. And that's just as you were saying that at that point, you've got so much that you can show for yourself, it's gonna be easier to attract that external funding. So it really depends on, I guess, the type of business that you want to do about what you what you would do in that case. But I think more universities are kind of realizing that it's just not that feasible for young people to start businesses without because you, you can't like if you don't already have a job yeah. or if you haven't got friends who could like give you money or anything, it's much tougher. So to me, it was, and, and my co founder it was really just getting financing from the university program to support ourselves. Same thing with that. Um, I got funding from my business, a short business course at the end. We had to pitch our business thing, and yeah, we got paid. I <laughs> <laughs> yeah. obviously it's paid to do the things for the business. Yeah, and I'm service based as well, so our costs. So we've got a foundation for young Australians, for example, I'm also um, a young social party and I was on the board a couple of years ago. Um, this is a program that's dedicated to helping young people with our social media. You know, our intake, they used to find um, what was 18 best young minds in the, um, in the country, and I think I was one of the first few young people to ever be in the program. But what they do is, if you are above the age of 18, between 18 to 27, you can actually apply with the FYA, and if your idea is really, really good enough, you get at least about ten thousand dollars to go to a business venture. So that is something that you know you can um, access 
and uh, you will also be provided with uh, mentorship. So you've got mentors for your finances, uh, business, and anything in order to get your um, project or program off the ground. So you get that for like about 12 months. Yeah, I do so, want to add, it's now 16. So you actually pick 16. 16. Well. Mm -hmm. you have different streams. I think it's about maybe 10 people per stream. And at the end, they can pitch. But everybody in the whole program, you get like two intensive workshops, you get all these people coming and talks, heaps of mentors. It's really, it's really good for you. So what's also the name of the organization? Uh, so Foundation for Young Australians, and the program is called um, Young Social Pioneers. Okay. So it's really worth applying. Hi, uh, my name is Jess. I'm from the city of Melbourne. So maybe contact. We actually are looking at um, trying to find ways that we can better support entrepreneurship within the municipality, particularly from. Um, diverse communities, so particularly from African communities. So, what are the things that you would like to see government doing to support, you know, those early stages of, of entrepreneurship? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've, I've written down, you know, mentoring all those sort of things. But what are the other things that you need and that you would like to see councils providing? I jump in and it's very, very quickly. The main thing that um, this is actually like a bit of a pet peeve of mine is that I find that the definition of what makes an entrepreneur is far too narrow. It's the whole view is that unless you've got this great, huge, huge, huge tech company, then you're not an entrepreneur. But the reality, especially if you're talking about women, especially, it is not going to be a big tech company. It could be, it's probably going to be service based. It doesn't mean that it's not still going to be a great company. And I feel like it's unrealistic to believe that like tech is not going to be a part of the business anyway. I feel like if you're starting a business now, tech is going to be really heavily involved uh, in every way. So I think if, if there was just one thing, it would just be to open it up of the type of businesses that could apply. And I, I my personal experience, the amount of time someone will keep talking over me just because we don't have a big tech platform, and when I explain it, does it make sense for us to have one? No one listens to me until some guy will say it, and they'll be like, yes, that's a really good point. I'm just kind of sitting there, <laughs> kind of sitting there like, I'm sorry that I'd like to really make sure that I know what to tell myself to develop this people like you said. But yeah, just opening it up is, is the biggest thing. Um, I'll say, I guess, this is actually based on what a few other city councils I've seen doing. Yarra City Council, they've got a young entrepreneurs program that they've just started. So they take them through a number of weeks, um, and I feel like I, I get a lot of your emails in the business section, and I feel like some of the, I think mean, it's like challenges that people have is that you have a lot of one-off things. So like, you know, come to this to learn about tax. Come to you know something three months later to learn about this. Do you know what I mean? But if you actually had something that was more like, like a, a short-term kind of thing, and they're learning specific things over that that particular time. I feel like that would draw people because they know that I'm going here and I'm going to get this and then the next week I'm coming back with this and that kind of thing. So I'd say, like, yeah, using those kind of models, I guess, what you're doing. Um, I guess I'm just spitballing this one. Thinking about in IT, we have innovation labs, so where you have like different innovators who come in, test their ideas. I think broadly thinking about an ideas hub kind of sits in that space, the space where people can come in. Even if you don't have finance, you can have an opportunity to test your idea, see if it works. And then if it doesn't, you're still in a group of other people testing their ideas as well. I think that would be a great idea. I guess the question I have for you is what what are you actually currently offering as a new sorry? Is it is it highly online, face to face? What type of program are you actually doing at the moment? At the moment, as you heard, some of it's ad hoc through our eco dev okay. our economic development department. Yeah. Um, but our largest um, investment, I guess, has been in the Western Business Accelerator and Centre for Excellence, yeah. which is a hub that um, people just past that startup phase can can come and access support and things like that, usually for a three year, ten year term, yeah. uh, or up to three years, after which point, hopefully, they've grown and been supported to self sustaining and all of those. How do you let um, people know of these programs? How do you market it? Is it do people actually you know? That's, I that's what I was going to ask you to talk. Because I feel like I feel like there's actually okay. quite a lot of amazing programs out there, but most people don't know anything about them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think the important thing is to find that you know, apart from trying to add a million other programs to programs which are probably actually just fine, you also need to think of letting people actually know that this exists in the first place. So they can actually know it's an option for them. Ashley. 
that. So use obviously things like social media, brilliant, right? Internet, like I think especially with young people, you have to find where do they, you know, where do they go? Like what social media platforms they're on, what type of um, events they go to, and focus on those um, areas. And then that would be a way for them to know that you guys exist and that it's actually an option for them um, to do this. Because a lot of them don't even realize, like she was asking about funding, they wouldn't know. Obviously, there's all these options, but they don't have access to that information. So if you can find ways, whether it's in schools or universities or wherever they congregate online or offline and target those, spa those spaces, then they'll know that it's actually there. I would quickly add, if you're not already, I would go for Facebook groups because I used to run a page that was all about just sharing opportunities with young people and everyone would just join on Facebook. We had like a thousand people for a couple of months and it was just constantly sharing and then people would just email me and be like, can you share the group? And then everyone then just had no idea that there were things about it. So it's yeah. just joining that comes up on Facebook. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, this is the last one we can take. There's not enough time. So can ask them after the session. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank